Uh, he's now retired and he's currently renovating a new property ideal for astronomy. He still gives public lectures on astrophysics, relative, red, can't say it, relativity and cosmology. He has a honor, honors physics bachelor of science from Newcastle University and a doctorate from, <clears throat> from the Imperial College London on infrared astronomy instrumentation. At the Royal Observatory Edinburgh, I worked on a multi-object spectrograph. He's at the University of Manchester Astronomy Department, worked on a Fabry Perro interferometer, uh, designed, built and used infrared photometer systems. At the RSRE and Deere and Quin Quinetech, senior scientists for a very successful infrared camera for a US defense satellite. He was then a consultant physicist to the Image Modeling Center on Imager Performance Modeling Objects, Unique Camera Performance and Prediction Programs. Was an associate lecturer for the Open, Open University Astronomy course and ran his own course at WT College. I'm not sure what that is. Chris? Uh, Worcester, Te Worcester Technical College. Right, Worcester Technical College for 11 years. Computer realization of astrophysical phenomena. The universe in 4D talk remains very, very popular. <clears throat> he formerly ran evening classes and courses. Invitations to give, call, to give talks all over the country. He continues his work on astroimaging and builds instruments related to this. He's a founder member of the Worcester Astronomical Society some t and uh, has been running for some 25 years and is still contributing. He was a webcam for astronomy image group and the Astro Spectral Imaging Group. Committee member of the British Astronomical Association Campaign for Dark Skies often speaking on light pollution issues, written a mathematical model of sky glow linked to industry. Um, <clears throat> the standard luminaire photom photometry data for comparing light pollution sky glow from different designs and making many predictions. Influenced the highways agency and presented at many European conferences, a summary of this towards Understanding Sky Glow was published by the Institution of Lighting Engineers in 2007 as their official reference guide. Caused new thinking in a road lighting design and standards. In 2008, this model was adopted by the North American Lightning, Lighting Industry and uh, it was the recipient of the Galileo Award for outstanding technical contributions to European dark skies. I think that's enough now. I think so. <laughs> Please, everybody, put their hands up and together to welcome Christopher Bedilly. Thank you. <laughs> right. Um, I, I don't think I can live up to that reputation. It doesn't sound like me at all. <laughs> anyway, um, right now we've got to learn about sharing screen. Is that right? Uh, do I should I press the screen? If you like okay. sharing screen. Okay. Nothing new. Um, Yes, it's starting to come. Okay, and I'm going to try to uh, uh, get my show on the road, uh, which should. Right, okay. Can That's everyone right. see the That's good. Okay, you can hear me as well. Right, okay. I've got some, some quality microphones in front of me. They look like the old BBC type. Um, anyway, um, this is going to be a bit of a tour de force because I'm hopeless at trying to reduce numbers of slides. And I've had to update this considerably because it was about seven years ago when I last gave it. And so much has happened since it's doubled in length and I've got my own work as well, which is an option at the end, but we'll see how we get on. Um, so I'll just get on with it. I'm going to start the time, otherwise, yes, counting down now. Okay, right. Um, well, you can see the title. <clears throat> Um, it's not quite what diet was built. I've opened it up not just to uh, UK rural skies, but um, international um, research using the uh, new satellites and various attempts to uh, reduce light pollution by various organisations. So let's go, go for it. 
I'm going to first of all uh, talk about uh, the uh, Commission for Dark Skies. Uh, that is um, um, what I've been associated with, the British Astronomical Organization uh, Commission for Dark Skies. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we've had some successes over the years in persuading district councils to adopt uh, lighting restrictions and planning controls. Um, the lighting industry has also come on board um, rather late in the day, uh, but they now have strict uh, advisory guidance notes. There have been various parliamentary inquiries we've been involved in, um, and I'm going to give us some examples of that and what are, some of the local officers have been up to over the years. So um, misconceptions. Uh, we do not want essential uh, lights off. We just want them well controlled. And uh, we believe in quality lighting means that everybody wins. We work for star quality lighting um, and only when it's needed and not at other times, obviously. Um, I went on the website of CFDS the other day to get update on the various leaflets that are available electronically. So this is just a sample of them. Uh, advisory notes on um, what you can do to uh, reduce uh, lighting spill how you can approach your neighbours if there's a problem, what your legal rights are, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, we've got a good set of leaflets that can be downloaded from the website. Um, we've also been involved in a parliamentary group, which I'm going to talk about a little bit um, later. Um, just in the last um, couple of months, our uh, campaign coordinator, Bob Meisen, who is very well known, um, has been uh, working on um, um, some handbooks. Uh, this is an update of our handbook, Blinded by the Light. It's been completely rewritten, available electronically or in printed versions. These are just some examples of it. Um, also, he's written um, just recently a children's um, little pamphlet for, for use in the schools for educational purposes. This is just uh, some examples from it. Um, where have all the stars gone? Um, these are somewhat older. He's written a book, um, and um, that's in the uh, um, light, uh, Responses and Remedies of Light Pollution in Patrick Moore's Practical Astronomy series. We've had advertisements uh, even in the Lighting Journal, which is the uh, primary lighting industry uh, monthly magazine with their collaboration, The Milky Way, The Wrong Way, etc catchy, isn't it? Um, we Many years ago, we were involved with Philips ma uh, maps and actually had uh, a printed uh, dark sky um, um, map of the UK, which I still refer to, actually. Um, but of course, so now you can get them online. And I think we were one of the early ones. We coordinated with um, Shinzanu, who had just done uh, a major electronic um, survey of the world using the existing satellite system at that time. We hosted the European Dark Sky Symposium quite some time ago now in 2006. Um, it's been quiet in recent years, but we hope to resurrect it. These are some of the awards we give for, for um, uh, uh, good lighting schemes, which is good publicity for the lighting engineers and for us. And these are just a sample uh, over the years uh, of the advertisement we get from the local photographer and the local newspaper, etc. Um, just a few examples of local officers' activities. This is a very recent one. Uh, Prestine, which is in Powers, not far from me here, is in a very dark uh, area. It's near Nathan Observatory. Uh, and um, it had very bad lighting in a very dark area. And the idea was to actually uh, try to get something done about it. First of all, the lighting engineer had to persuade the council that it was an affordable, achievable, and worthwhile doing. And he had to get the local community on board as well. A major achievement in doing that. It wasn't dead easy. Um, these are taken with a, a drone, uh, uh, an official allowed commercial uh, uh, drone to take pictures of the trial relighting in which the public could see what was uh, going to be done through the town. Um, careful downward lighting, previously it was up and all over the place. Um, this is some of the conversions you can see in just a few shots in the video. Uh, this is ongoing. 
Now this goes back to one of my, uh, my early attempts where the local ambulance service decided to actually put globe lights um, in a semi-rural area for their new headquarters without planning permission. And the planning authorities contact me to make an objection. And these are the photographs of the globe lights, which they had to take down. So I was in fear that I, would, uh, I might not, if I hadn't, not be picked up by the local ambulance. <laughs> but um, they were forced to replace them just as well. Uh, our local officer in Bath uh, had uh, a, a real battle with the University of Bath when they relit their uh, sports facilities on the area, of, uh, on the borders of an A and B, and it just lit the whole horizon. And eventually he managed to get to replace the lights with better directed ones. Unfortunately, it's now just Steve's, but I remember him well. He did an awful lot for us. Um, now, the lighting industry, the Institute of Lighting Professionals, now it's called, it used to be the ILE. Um, this, I downloaded these this morning because my slides were out of date. Lots of planning for policy frameworks, uh, information about what is good practice, what isn't, keep lighting down uh, where it's needed. Um, these figures here came from one of my um, collaborations and calculations for the highways agency um, about 15 or 20 or oh, many years ago, um, but they seem to be an adopted. Um, I, I actually did publish a lighting guide with the ILP, not as I'm a member. I collaborated with one of those senior members who was very interested in my work. And then we did a deal. Um, he's on the publication committee. Um, I'm not anything. Um, if I write the article, he can become co-author if he gets through, through the publication committee, and he did. <laughs> um, environmental zones, um, the lighting level in environmental zones is always too high, and they tend to forget that light doesn't have any borders, it just carries on everywhere. Even so, uh, there are restrictions according to the class of lighting. Um, uh, E0 is completely dark sky parts, rural, E1, um, pretty rural, E2, suburban, etc., E4, a centre of towns and so forth. What uh, lighting levels are allowed, where there are curfews, what light levels uh, are allowed in intrusion on bedroom windows, etc. There are lots of constraints. And now they're actually using astronomical units as well. I think that's just a lip service because I don't think they understand them and they can't actually uh, do any measuring and haven't done so far. Again, uh, the Clean Neighbourhoods Act, uh, there's a big feature about that. I'll be coming on to that in a minute. Um, and this is our advisory note that we wrote and looks rather similar to the one that's now in the, uh, on their website. Some examples of good and bad practice. These unfortunate slides are going back for over 10 years ago when low pressure sodium was replacing, uh, being replaced by high pressure sodium. Um, Semi, semi cut off, and I was advocating full cut off. And there were a lot of arguments with the lighting and things. Like full cut off, it's so directional, you have to have more poles and more lights, and then where are you? But in fact, you don't, it's just not true. And I proved it. That's why I wrote my uh, program to actually prove they were wrong. There was a parliamentary inquiry because one of the MPs was interested in astronomy. And so the Science and Technology Committee uh, investigated in 2003 with a series of recommendations. Unfortunately, the result was the Clean Neighbourhoods Act, which covered insects, bees and all sorts of things. But it did put certain restrictions um, on the use of lighting. And so uh, depending on whether the, uh, there was a legality involved, you could, in theory, take the matter to court without having to pay for it yourself. However, there were so many, uh, and still, it still applies, there are so many uh, uh, exclusions, for example, transport services, um, uh, up lighthouses, obviously, uh, um, prisons, uh, but particularly transport and communication centers, that it's not that effective. Um, um, and I don't know anyone's actually taken their neighbor to court and won with them shining a light through their bedroom window, which is what it was supposed to be about. More recently, last year, um, a parliamentary group was formed. Um, uh, these are voluntary, they're cross-party, uh, all-party parliamentary group for um, dark skies. Um, this was um, Lord Rees, who's just been 
airing his thoughts on what uh, uh, life will be like on the planet in, in 2050, um, just finished now. Um, of course, he's very well known uh, for all his books, and uh, he was an eminent cosmologist, etc. astronomer royal, and very concerned about light pollution as well. Um, so um, that and the member of parliament, South Downs, and several others got together to form this group. And they have made recommendations to the government. Uh, I don't expect you to read all this, but there are 10 recommendations to the government, and the government has to respond. Um, on controlling lighting that should be administered, it shouldn't be split between different departments, which it is now, no one taking full responsibility. Um, uh, it should be very much part of the Planning Act and not fussing around, but make it quite concrete, et cetera, good for the environment, et cetera, there's a whole load of stuff. Um, we all know about energy wastage and global warming. Well, these are figures I calculated long ago in fact, this uh, 0.43 kilograms per kilowatt hour is what quite a lot of lighting engineers use as a figure when they're trying to reduce the amount of um, um, uh, electricity by switching to LED lighting and argue the case that um, they're saving the planet uh, because they're generating um, less CO2 emissions. I have done for my house just recently and the national grid has improved its uh, carbon footprint considerably. Um, I reckon it's about 0.23 now, although last year they got to 0.18, but on average it's about 0.3. It depends how you measure it, um, but you know, um, it's that order anyway. Um, it amounts to two power stations of electricity being thrown into the sky every year. National laws. Now, the most effective one came uh, was. Uh, introduced by the French government in 2018, but there are others. And it's starting to take effect now, because of course there's a breathing space to get all the lightings changed. Uh, it's very strict. Uh, now France has a similar population to us, but twice the area. So it's got a lot more dark area skies. And the question is, can they actually increase that footprint and, or, or, you know, uh, and preserve it? Um, they're, they've got some pretty strong constraints on types of, line, uh, of lights allowed, uh, how long they can be on for, uh, and dimming and so forth. It's, it's pretty good. Whether it'll work or not remains to be seen. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, fauna and flora. Um, I was quite surprised about uh, 10 days ago, I attended um, the artificial uh, light at night um, virtual conference. I was doing a poster paper and I've been doing a lot of polarization measurements on the sky, which if I have time, I'll be showing you later. And uh, there's a poster paper by a lady who I've had, I have been able to contact. She, she's from the University of Bristol, but she's not in the faculty listing. And I don't know her email address, but I was very impressed by a poster paper. So was everyone else. I think she got the prize for it. Um, and I'm taking the liberty of showing you some of this. It's to do with uh, spiders. I wasn't aware that many common spiders rely on polarization of the night sky to orientate themselves. And uh, she's done a lot of work on that. Um, uh, pollinating insects are active at night and that um, in any decent, any level of light pollution, they can't navigate, they can't um, uh, cope with it. Uh, and um, because uh, they use the moon and the Milky Way for orientation. And they are responsible for pollinating agricultural crops. And of course, we know there's been a vast reduction in pollinating insects because we no longer see them stuck to our windscreens anymore when we drive anywhere. Migratory birds are very much affected uh, as well. And anything that's uh, like bats that actually use uh, um, insects for food are affected some more so than others. Um, um, I've just discovered that migratory birds actually, and including the robin, use have magnetic centers in the back of their eyes. And that was a revelation to me as well. So here's a collage of um, insects and uh, they are attracted by blue rich LED lighting, particularly rather than orange. And once they get in wet environments stuck on a light, then that's it. Um, it can, uh, a set of globe lights in a park um, in wet conditions can eliminate most of the flying insects in just one night. Um, bird orientation, um, 
It's now um, the uh, um, uh, Empire State Building used to be illuminated and now they turn it off during the migratory season because otherwise they have so many bird strikes, huge numbers. That's also true of uh, illuminated uh, uh, transmitted towns throughout America. Um, and this is uh, examples of uh, insects being stuck in the globe light in the park. And um, certainly glow worm worms have a hard time these days. Um, and um, all night lighting results in all light growing of trees around them, which uh, weakens the, the trees and the flora is being affected as well. Um, now this is the uh, lady who uh, has posted a paper in me. I really would like to contact her because she's looking at the polarization of the sky. You may be aware that the sky is strongly polarized in the presence of sunshine and of the moon at right angles to the direction of the light source, the moon of the sun. Um, and uh, you can see that with polarizing sunglasses. It's really scattering, it's due to the scattering of the light in the upper atmosphere, which is um, the, the air molecules such as the electric dipoles. And so they interact in the ultraviolet range, particularly um, where the resonance matches. And um, the result is the light scatter is strongly polarized. And so it has a direction normally at right angles to the direction of the source. And I love this graphic, so I wish I had the software that could actually um, display this myself. I haven't managed to find it anywhere, but people seem to use it. Um, just demonstrating. But this is in moonlight. I've been interested in, in, in when it's really dark, is there still any light pollution? Is it from artificial lighting uh, at a great distance or is it entirely due to the sun or the moon being below the horizon? And um, anyway, there's a criteria. These uh, eyes of these spiders are not like ordinary eyes. They don't have lenses. They just see an overall polarization level. And if it's above a certain level, then they can navigate. Um, but if it's blanked out by background light, they can't navigate. And she's been looking at different dark sky parks to see what levels they are and comes to some conclusion that some dark sky, uh, spike, dark sky parks are affected and others are not. But of course, spiders and other insects don't rely entirely on polarization. Um, switching to the human eye, uh, we know that um, we have color sensors and monochrome sensors, and monochrome sensors are far more sensitive, and uh, they're around the periphery, uh, and the color sensors are more central in the, uh, on the retina. Um, but um, the response is totally different from that of cameras, etc. And we can respond quite well to uh, um, blue, uh, to uh, green light, uh, obviously in the visible, but uh, at low light levels, we're more sensitive to blue light uh, in visible um, uh, bright light conditions, it's the other way around. Uh, so switching LEDs now they're available uh, to uh, have a high blue content means they can run them at a low light level and to the human eye, they're still very sensitive. Unfortunately, of course, they tend to increase the light level at the same time, which is self-defeating. Um, it takes at least 20 minutes to become dark adaptive, um, and everyone's response is different. Excessive blue light at night uh, affects melatonin production. Uh, melatonin is produced um, in, in a, a gland at the back of the um, brain, and it fixes the circadian rhythm. It puts the body clock back into sync with um, daylight conditions, otherwise it runs at a different rate. So it, it, melatonin production uh, occurs in the middle of the night. And if any blue uh, lighting gets into the eye, it stops immediately. Uh, but what light level? Of course, people are looking at their mobile phones and TV and computers, I'm as guilty as anyone. And this, of course, disrupts the behavior of a normal circadian rhythm gives us loss of sleep and so forth. And there is some link to uh, shift workers having more breast cancer. Uh, in, there's a lot of medical uh, discussion about it. And that has been going for quite some years. So it has serious repercussions. Um, melatonin is, is given deliberately as a drug to control uh, otherwise uncontrollable children. It, it brings their body clock into sync. Crime and lighting, because there's a lot of misconception over the years, 
it's a fear of crime rather than the actuality. Um, uh, it's been found that if you floodlight a school at night, um, it gets more break-ins because the, um, the felons don't need to carry a torch and they can get away so they can see what they're after. True uh, of, of lights parked under, uh, cars parked under lights, the more likely to be broken into than if they're not parked under a light. I can certainly vouch for that when I lived on a housing estate myself. Um, the break-ins for cars under lights, but not when they weren't. Um, um, so it, um, there was a study done quite a few years ago <clears throat> by the lighting industry about converting lights on a street and how much crime there was before and during and after. Uh, and it actually said that it reduced during the installation, uh, but they didn't actually explain that it actually went up again afterwards. Uh, of course, because of all the business of installation, then there were less uh, local uh, crime done. And the thing is, it only takes, it's probably the same criminals, probably the same bag snatchers all the time. And if one of them falls ill, then it, 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 it completely changes the statistics while they're out of action. Um, so all these breakages and whatever, uh, these felonies are actually done by just a handful of people. So what do you believe about the statistics? Uh, there was a big study independently done by a statistician to show that actually the lighting industry cases were really rubbish. Um, so let's have a look at a few examples of the good and bad and ugly. So here we go. Um, this, uh, I find this quite interesting. This is a, one of the few fairly good designs of light on the top left that you could buy in a Super Bowl and DIY shops. Most of them total rubbish. This lower one, this leaflet, I find amazing. I just love it. You see, there's a rather large hole in this chap's wall. <laughs> so he's put a security light up and he's decided to floodlight his neighbor completely. This is actually the instruction manual for installation. <laughs> I find it hard to believe. It actually shows the light deliberately passing over the fence with this hole in the wall. Anyway, uh, clearly that's not a good idea. Um, domestic security lights. If you have a light shining out from your back door, um, then uh, you can't see what, if there's an intruder, um, what they're doing. Um, if it's you know, shining straight in the eyes, it needs to point down. You can get good pointing down lights. So I have installed them quite successfully um, in my, uh, outside my house. And they only come in for a minute, on a, for a minute or two. They've got photo center and that's it. Uh, it can be done. I just realized this is a rather old graphic. It doesn't actually show you anything about LEDs. This is a conversion from about 10 years ago from uh, low pressure sodium to high pressure sodium. It was an example of even older mercury. Um, this is the spectral content. So no more uh, single orange uh, lights with a broader spectrum of high pressure sodium um, looking pinkish. Uh, mercury lamps, of course, had lights all um, wavelengths emissions all over the place. But in the high pressure sodium, there is a blue content. People tend to forget that. Because LEDs, it's totally different now. Um, I'll show you some LED spectrums later. If there's a, a lighting scheme proposed, I like this one. This is in America. The lighting engineers decided to ask people, the community, what they thought, what they liked best. They put up various lights and decided, which do you think is the best? They all chose 3A, it's most directional. So they didn't have to win the public very hard, um, just showed them the advantages of doing it right. Um, this is the conversions of 10 years ago from low pressure sodium to high pressure sodium in my area. Um, this is the sort of lighting that uh, is, has a ribbed, uh, the L-type LPSs, which had plastic louvres uh, and were a box and the light could scatter everywhere. Uh, and then um, you get these awful post tops where the light is mostly horizontal and almost none on the ground. You can see the profile against this wall. It's all going horizontal and not on the ground. Um, we've still got some of these. Um, They've got some plus points and some minus points uh, in the center of town. Um, they are attempted to be hooded, but because they've got this ellipsoidal bowl, um, you get two foci. So you've got the light source there, 
and an image of a light source underneath that then sends light in all directions. Uh, I know it's only a 10% reflection, but even so, I'm not very keen on them. They may look as if they're full cut off, but actually you get quite a lot of reflection in the, in the bowl. I suppose that's the spread of light along the road, but it spreads it everywhere. In our case, uh, you can see these right across the, the, the Severn Valley, because this is road um, up in the town, uh, are quite high, high above the rest of the uh, rest of the town. These are box lights. You can see them quite a lot in America in rural areas. Um, they are fairly well controlled and low pressure sodium, and so they don't have this very broad emission. Um, um, you can, of course, persuade your council if you're lucky to actually put a a metal plate to obscure the light coming into your front doorstep, pointing out that um, you shouldn't be paying for lighting your front doorstep, it's only supposed to be the road you're paying for. Uh, that was one I had fitted at my house in Hill when I lived in town. This is bad practice, you can see the light is actually illuminating the chimney pots here. This is because it's not full cut off, it's got a, a curved polycarbonate bowl and the light has a retro reflection and comes back out again. This is full cut off. You can see it's very sharp. Uh, so it's not get shining into the bedroom windows except for one. And all railway stations have full cut off lighting so that the drivers aren't uh, uh, upset by um, glare from lights. Um, this is a conversion of the M5 many years ago. Now the highway is actually only illuminate the M5 and other motorways at junctions, not the rest of the time. Headlights are quite good enough for motorways, and I think this is a good thing. Um, these are one of the first conversions uh, to uh, high pressure sodium. Uh, well, full cut off. This is full cut off. It has limited uh, um, uh, um, illumination because uh, as the light comes out at an angle, you get to grazing instance and then retro reflects back, back inside the bowl and out another angle. So there is a natural cut off by the flat glass itself. Um, this is an example of a bad retro fit, Cosmopolis lights. Um, you can see that the lights are illuminating the whole house frontages and the bedroom windows, absolutely awful. And you can see the stripes as well, it's very uneven, you see the stripes. Um, this is a globe light. Well, we all know how awful those are. Half the light goes into the sky. And because of the shadow from the pole, you can't actually see under the light. There's a lady actually sitting under this light, but you can't see her. It's this person here. She's actually under the globe light and you can't see her at all. That's the shadow. Um, I mean, you see car parks, shopping centers, etc. how it shouldn't be done and how it can be done. Um, this is uh, my local um, Waitrose supermarket. The trouble is they put Louvre lightings, you can see them right across the valley. Um, they're not ideal. Um, and in the centre of town, they put a, uh, a light on a building that faces right up the road and causes major glare. Well, it does to me anyway. Every time you drive down this road at night, all I get is this glare from this light. It's a corner cube to avoid putting them on poles for environmental reasons. Illuminated car park in the middle of a rural area. Um, um, absolutely awful pool docks, of course. Uh, are they really worried about um, invasion with helicopters? I'm not sure, but it looks like it in this one. I'd hate to live in that house next to that light source. This is a pub car park. It should be illuminating the car park, not the, not the environment. These are badly illuminated buildings, many examples here. Um, it can be done well. This is, I gave an award to uh, automatic packaging system because they've got down light, as you can see. It's very well controlled, they're part of the building. Um, these are some, again, local to me, down lighters as opposed to up lighters. While our Priory Church in Melbourne has up lighters, and uh, Needle Spire in, in Worcester, similarly. Uh, and this is Covington Village Church, absolutely horrific. Then there's the famous case of the Guildford nightclub. The nightclub owner said he was doing a favour to advertise the town. He wasn't, he was advertising his nightclub. It went up, um, he had to take them down. Um, anything that's portable that could be moved um, is allowed to stay up for up to a month. For example, circuses, 
can apply to have um, lights in the sky to advertise, but only for limited periods. Um, if it's a permanent installation, they have to get planning permission. That went up to um, the ministerial level, who actually came down because of the public inquiry, uh, and, and they had to take them down, the, uh, the nightclub owner had to remove them. This is the awful lighting of Humber Bridge, uh, without lighters going into the sky. And, well, pool can be seen at a great distance, a pool ferry terminal. Um, there's no need to light the sky in quite so much detail as they are. Um, this is, uh, um, this was Gloucester, uh, seen from the Cotswold Birdlip Hills uh, by me. This is a very recent one, this is post-Brexit. Um, because of the restriction in, in parking at uh, Dover Docks, they've had to build a huge lorry park near Ashford to accommodate for uh, checking um, border control for lorries. Uh, this was uh, uh, next to the retail park, was otherwise rural. Now it's this in the last year. All the neighbours are now faced with huge amounts of light in the sky. There are lots of complaints, including the local councillors and MPs. And of course, it's an afterthought to think about what they can do about it. Um, this is Bath, um, City Bath. The football lighting uh, is um, uh, brighter than the uh, um, Bath Abbey um, illumination. Frequently, sports facilities are lit temporarily, even when uh, a school um, decides it wants to open up and improve its uh, sports facilities and to the public and have um, meetings in the evenings. They put in for planning permission with decent lights and change them at the last minute to rubbish. Um, this one, uh, the light has actually got a photo cell on the top of it. The actual street light has gone out because there's a football pitch here illuminating this building and it's so bright it's turned the lights off. <laughs> um, these people, quite common this problem, um, a golf driving range uh, has been built with floodlights going horizontally uh, right over the county boundary uh, and it's driving the neighbours, uh, the residents mad. But because it's in the next county, the council can't do anything about it. Um, greenhouses, particularly in Holland, uh, for rapidly growing uh, uh, plants, tomatoes and the like, um, use lights themselves. Now, in, in particularly in Holland, there are very restrictions. They have to put blinds over at night and so forth. That isn't the case everywhere, but even so, Holland is one of the most illuminated all night countries in the world. I'm talking about students at universities, they, most of the university departments have observatories on their roofs and are completely light polluted. Um, this is a case of Canada uh, where there was a power cut and what a difference between the power cut and not a power cut. Um, moving on, these are um, um, uh, the International Dark Sky uh, Movement, International Dark Sky Association, has uh, gathered the pace and was very influential and set lighting standards uh, uh, for application for dark sky places, national parks throughout the world, etc. areas outstanding natural beauty. If you have public outreach, have an ordinance, uh, have well-controlled lighting, then you can apply for various standards uh, of recognition. Um, um, these are the uh, centres and organisations that they have associated all over the world. Um, there's a measuring program app for mobile phones that is used quite extensively. I'm not sure how accurate it is. Um, they award uh, various awards for achievements. I even got one myself. Uh, and then in this country, the CPRE, the Council of Protection of Rural England, that has an annual nightlight campaign in which you're supposed to count the number of stars on a dark night in Iran or whatever, they have resources. They're using the international satellites and um, you can see the difference in uh, reflected light off the ground between 1993 and 2000. Switching back and forwards, it's getting worse and worse. This is a recent one, you can download these maps. This is showing the uh, uh, interactive satellite radiance map. This is all done with the current calibrated satellite which is the uh, Suomi satellite um, visible and in infrared um, um, system band, day-night day band, radiance map, 
it replaces the DMSP satellites that weren't well calibrated. The problem is it doesn't have any blue rich uh, sensitivity. It's a visible infrared spectrometer infra imaging system and gives false readings for LED lights, which of course we now have everywhere. This is just showing the dark sky parks. Um, we advocate looking for some faint stars around Polaris because you can do that any time of year. Um, uh, a uh, here is about magnitude 4.5 and the rest are fainter. I have difficulty even seeing A, so it's extremely subjective. I was at Yosemite Park two years ago, and even then, in the darkest of environments, I couldn't see beyond um, star A. Um, but others I know can see all of them. So the problem with star counts, it's very subjective. It depends where, how your pupil relaxed, how, how, how dilated it can be. The older you are, the less dilated it is. And, the, uh, and it's, this diameter determines the amount of air, uh, light you can capture. Um, the background will be the total light level from the stars is dependent on the area. And so the contrast is dependent on how, how wide your, uh, your iris can dilate. So it's a bit subjective. National parks, um, well, we have quite a few, an increasing number of, of them have qualified for dark sky status. Here are just some examples. I'm sure you know your local one, uh, North York, a new forest, Norfolk Broads, that's a bit of a problem. Uh, in theory, Norfolk's very dark, but I guess it's probably quite close to Norwich. South Downs um, looks really dark. I'm very impressed by that. Um, Dumfries and Galloway, Jersey, came, et cetera. These are just some of them, Breton Beacons, et cetera. And then, of course, there's Kielder with its public observatory, with its public outreach and regular uh, classes and instructions to the public and also to school kids. And it's manned all the time. I've actually been up there. I gave a lecture up there a few years ago. I hadn't quite finished it then. It's very impressive in the dark site. This is the Kielder site here. These are all these 46 AOMBs. Um, but um, um, the dark sky parts I've just shown, but these are all the AOMBs which are associated. We have 46. Um, dark sky tourism is catching on. This is an example of a uh, otherwise rather rundown village in the Pyrenees that saw an opportunity for going for dark sky tourism. They got some Spanish government money uh, and it's been very successful. We've got an observatory. And this one is amazing. I've actually been here, the center of observatory of the university here, Starlight Reserve, uh, Monsec Mountains in Catalonia. It is really impressive. The whole area is a dark sky reserve. They got government money, but the tourism they get, get is more than paid for it. Uh, 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 bed and breakfasts and so forth. The main uh, planetarium at the end of the show, the whole planetarium dome rolls off to reveal the whole, the, the actual sky above. That really is impressive. And the director is very active in, in, in dark sky surveys. Um, collaborations internationally for scientific modeling, etc., is what I want to cover next. Um, this is a threat. Uh, this was um, some time ago, uh, 1995, and that's the prediction on 2025. This is based on satellite observations together with atmospheric modeling, put the two together to actually give you an idea because the satellite observations only give you what's the upward light and not what's uh, scattering the atmosphere sideways and back down again. Um, but you can see it's already gone right across the English Channel and it's just going to get worse unless it's controlled. And there have been, this is just from our dark sky map, just some examples of, of the light levels, uh, but you can download uh, uh, information from several sites now, which I'll be showing you. But we were one of the first, this is um, Dumfries and Galloway. Okay, I mentioned satellites. The so DMSP satellites weren't calibrated, but at least they actually were enable them, uh, um, the dark sky community to do surveys worldwide. And most of the maps you see in pretty pictures were done with the DMS satellites, but they weren't well calibrated. And now they've been succeeded by SWOMI VIRS, which I mentioned already, which is calibrated and has higher resolution. It's still not very high. I mean, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of meters resolution, uh, so you can't see individual installations. But you can see the variation over time. But the, these are used for population development uh, studies, 
um, political studies, commercial development studies, etc. not just light pollution as such. Lighting is an indication of all sorts of uh, uh, growth, um, political boundaries, etc. Just look at North Korea or even Myanmar at the moment. Um, um, this is, it also conducts CO2 emissions from DMSBL data. Um, the problem, as I mentioned with the new system, is it has no blue sensitivity. So it tends to give wrong results. It looks as if the sky has darkened with new installations, when actually it's brighter. Um, you can download this map, it's interactive. I did the other day. Um, and uh, you can actually see what anything is in your area. Uh, these uh, are updated yearly um, with the surveys from the satellites and also comparing different spectral bands. Uh, you can look at it in Johnson V band or one of the other bands, but not the blue, as I said. I did a comparison with my own, own sky. This is my own sky and my old sky camera. Um, that's the, the isopop plot. It, the Milky Way was overhead at the time. It was done in 2018 in, in, uh, um, uh, in July. Uh, and that is the uh, recent Gaia map based uh, study uh, together with, uh, no doubt, with the um, uh, uh, Suomi satellite, but using Gaia information on the Milky Way. It's quite a good match for the same date and time. Not completely, it doesn't get all the sky glue in. Um, I've identified all these sources. But it is pretty good, and the ratings figures are more or less right. You can select which band you want. I've always been interested in how it falls off with distance. What fraction of the light pollution at the zenith is due to very distant towns and cities, say, beyond the horizon? There have been some theoretical studies many years ago. This is a fairly recent one based on measurements, and I more or less agree with this. Um, I would say uh, I can see light pollution domes from my observatory setup up to 150 kilometers away, way above the horizon. But what fraction of that is affecting my zenith? I say about 10 to 15 percent, which looks more or less right here. This is a study uh, in Milan uh, of relighting before and after. And the issue is, of course, that it's um, uh, the Salome satellite has no detection of the bluish content. Uh, it says the light intensity has dropped by 50%. In fact, it's increased by 27% due to the blue light emissions, but it doesn't see it. Um, Chris Kyber is always writing papers and collaborations. This is a change um, in, since over the years um, uh, of global lighting generally. Um, um, there have been a lot of studies, I'm aware of a time. This is um, a study um, in, uh, uh, on the lighting in Tucson recently, they managed to persuade the public lighting to be turned off. Uh, so before and after, what was the change seen by the satellites? The answer is not a lot. Most of it is private or shops, shop frontages. It's only dropped by about 15%. While um, a rural sky and a dark sky area around um, um, uh, some German villages, there was a considerable drop, as you'd expect, it was mostly public lighting. Uh, this is an attempt in Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, um, Mayo, um, to uh, relight uh, sensibly uh, under the arches of some of the main features in the Dark Sky Reserve. This I thought was an interesting talk about relighting of the centre of London, reducing the energy, reducing it because it's, it's just getting overlit um, and um, the idea is to try to control the lighting out of office hours and control it a lot better. And there's a prediction. The prediction is this is possibly the future, how things could be in the future is a bit airy fairy. The prediction is that they could reduce it by about 20%, 30%. Um, these are uh, studies in, in national parks in, in America. And the answer is yes, relighting does help. But you really need to keep the color temperature below 2200 K because the blue content is, kills it and you end up with more light pollution than you had before. Um, I'm going to switch to satellite views and where of the time, we've only got 15 minutes left at most. Um, this is the relighting around London and the M25. Um, this is a very sophisticated um, program, um, long succeeding my own modeling. Uh, that will calculate the atmospheric scattering 
whether luminaires are, what type they are, the spectral content, to do multiple scattering over the whole sky, it requires a supercomputer because most of the light just doesn't get to the receiver. It's because it's doing multiple scattering. But with a supercomputer, you can, you know, uh, you can you can wait until you get an actual hit from the source via multiple scatterers to the, re the receiver, uh, and it's quite remarkable. It's the one to go for. Uh, it's been developed and been tested on Quebec, and Ontario, uh, and even on Tenerife. Which what would be effective to reduce the light of the observatories? Which bit of the which local area would be most effective change compared with most of it would, wouldn't make a lot of difference. I'm just showing a few pictures here and I'm moving on to my own modeling work. Um, this is just some examples of what I've done myself in my back garden. Um, my basic model um, was very simple. Uh, it just took uh, ray traces from any given type of light using the industry information photometry as a function of angle, reflecting it off the ground into the sky together with the direct component and then taking each bit uh, in a line of sight and find how much is scattered back down in the direction of a line of sight along this path from the illumination of the air molecules with the atmospheric content that they have as a function of, 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 of height uh, and, and air pressure. So it's direct radiated, it's reflected off the ground and so forth. It varies and you integrate it all along and do the calculation. Um, first of all, you've got to have the polar diagram of the light. Now, this is an example. Um, this is the amount of light that's being across the road um, um, along the road and diagonally all shown on the same polar plot so this is this is this is vertical that's horizontal uh, uh, sorry that's downwards that's horizontal and that's upwards this is looking from above for contour plots I don't often see that but I plotted it in two dimensions this is just a typical light you see it's cast along the road mostly and not so much backwards uh, this is a spectral content according to what type of light it is as a function of wavelength uh, you do the reflectivity off the ground. Grass is very reflective in the in the red and infrared, where it's throwing away the heat. It doesn't want it. Uh, it doesn't want uh, photosynthesis occurs in the red, and it, it wants to reject all the infrared light. So the very reflective infrared, and it's basically green because the photosynthesis is taking the the red content out. Um, and, and of course, it depends on how rough the surface is. Um, so you do uh, a light uh, scattering. Um, uh, profile and then uh, at some angle when the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence you're going to get a spectral peak a, a sorry reflective peak as if it was a mirror particularly if there's water on the ground so it's a combination of that so what you get um, coming out is dependent on what angle it comes in and how rough the surface is if it's rough like a piece of paper completely then it's just a surface area um, projection Otherwise, if it's got a, a mirror content, then it'll have a peak and just put the whole thing together, ray tracing, scattering off buildings, so forth like that, and put the whole thing together and then do the um, molecular scattering, which is equal backwards and forwards in the upper atmosphere, uh, or the lower water droplet dust content of the lower atmosphere, which is always in the forwards direction, hardly anything backwards. Put the whole thing together. For example, here's a blue sky. Um, dark sky, molecular scattering in all directions. Here is uh, water droplets in, in Paris and the Eiffel Tower beam can only be seen when it's pointing at you. If you don't believe me, look at this. I took these myself. The, the beam is going round. You can only see it when it's pointing towards the camera. When it's right angles, you can't see it at all. Very directional. Here is an assimilation of the sun just below the horizon. Uh, this is water droplet, me scattering and dust. This is Rayleigh scattering in the air molecules. You see, the, the dust is very directional, soon cuts off. But as soon as the sun's below the horizon, the rest stays a lot longer. So it depends what type of light it is from what source as to how much scattering is horizontal. These are just some examples. You then put the atmosphere in and then do the calculations, integrating as I described before, and then I get a result. So here is the uh, spectral sky glow as a function of uh, elevation in the sky um, for a clear sky according to what type of light you have. So I've looked at LEDs at different types. Um, I put this is a sort of map of spectrum against angle on the, um, in the atmosphere, elevation angle in the atmosphere against spectral content and it varies of course. And this is the result. 
So here you've know, got a viewer, say, 10 kilometers away um, from a single source with no other source. Uh, and I'm looking at LED comparing uh, with the same illuminance on the ground. So that's towards the light where it will actually be very much higher. It's a logarithmic scale. So minus 90 is towards the light. Zero is overhead. 90 is in the opposite direction where you get backscatter. And you can see how um, these are LEDs, which are very well directional. So there isn't much horizontal, so there isn't much backscatter. Here, there's uh, a lot of backscatter from the old type lights, but they were monochromatic and not polychromatic. A big improvement is further to be made if you can get rid of the blue rich content altogether. So that was my model, which fits the facts. This is my area uh, and this is my sky locally from the top of the Malvern Hills and it, how, how it's changed over the years. This is looking across the Seven Valley and it's gone a lot bluer than it was ever was before. This is my observatory. Uh, I'm lucky to live in a rural environment. There are no local lights at all. And this is the setup. That's the photometer, an SQM at an angle. So it never sees the Milky Way. If I tilt it 20 degrees north, never at any time of the year will it see the Milky Way. That's the all sky camera. That takes a reading every two minutes throughout the year, regardless. And I look at the data of interest when it's dark and not the rest, but I have complete records that were set in power cuts. Uh, this is the all sky camera, which I run every 30 seconds taking a picture only when I'm out of the observatory on the darkest of nights. This is the rest of the setup. Um, I have to correct for the fisheye lens distortion on the focal plane and also the vignetting, the fact it's less sensitive at the edge. Best way to do that is to take a foggy day when the light's coming equally from all directions. And uh, I've tried pudding bowls, but actually a foggy day is far better and curve fit to it and correct it out. This is my area. These are a survey I did geographically taking light readings over the area uh, about 10 years ago. Um, this is a summary of the all sky cameras uh, taken in various areas. And I could identify the sky glow because it shifted around with the location. That's Birmingham, which is about 60 kilometers away. Um, I've now, because I, got, I normally run it on a mast permanently, so I have all these records. My latest is to actually look at the skewness. This is Malvern and Worcester. This is Hereford, which is, I did a study for the relighting of it. This is, this is Bristol, this is Cheltenham. Um, there's even Monmouth and Newport. Um, and I look at the skewness. What I can do now, uh, this is comparing with the Suomi satellite data, which was shown before. That's the Milky Way. This is isophots, and that's the Milky Way. Um, I found that I can do curve fitting quite accurately. This is a parameter, that's my vignetting curve fit, and that is my curve fit to the profile of my local sky. It only requires five parameters, and I can fit a pretty good curve right through the actual data. That uplift is used to the Milky Way. So in exactly, it's 0.3 of a magnitude. That's how much the Milky Way contributes. My background is about 21.1 magnitudes per square arc second on a really good night. And I can fit these curves very simply. Uh, this is a record of a single night, um, uh, a good night. It always gets darker and darker through midnight and then before dawn starts getting lighted. It always gradually drops. So it depends what time of night as to what result you will get. And this is a histogram of the distributions. And I can do it for any one night or the, all the nights in a year where it was reasonably clear. Um, I can do it for any night. For the, for the um, color content, I need to know what the spectral content of the camera is and the sky quality meter. So I've done all that. I've looked them off of the internet. And look at the color variations in the sky. It can suddenly change dramatically due to fog or mist obscuring some lights or letting light through from others. Uh, this is Hereford on a cloudy night that suddenly changed and then disappeared. That's Morven and the Hereford lights are completely gone. It can change over a few minutes but gradually it's getting whiter and whiter, but it can suddenly completely change color if it's slightly misty or hazy. Asymmetry. Well, I was very interested in asymmetry. Um, this, is what, um, uh, this is due to snow. There was snow on the ground that night, and this is the snow lit sky. Um, and how it's asymmetric is simply because there are no towns in this direction beyond the horizon. And so, Actually, what I do, I take the isophots there 
I rotate the image to 180 degrees, subtract the 180 degree image from the original and replot the isophots. And that tells me how, how skew it is. And I can get the skewness and therefore work out the fraction of lights beyond the horizon contribution. And that's what I've been doing recently. That's the asymmetry for several nights. And it's pretty steady. Um, that's the setup, the old sky camera. And now I've been doing polarization measurements. Uh, this is my second last topic. We're nearly finished. I've got four minutes, apparently. That should be about it. Um, Free to go on a bit if you want. Well, I, I, I don't want to bore you anyway, but I'm, I'm OK. I think I'm going to finish. I think we've got 200 sliders as the record. <laughs> anyway, um, not wanting to, to mess around with the focal plane of my camera, I've actually built these filter rings around it. And of course, it's the all sky lens is curved. And it's only the, the edge bit that sees the horizon. So I have to have a curved filter to match it, which I couldn't do at the end. So this is my semi the filter, I block the ends off eventually and I rotate it round. And that works sort of. Off. Um, this is um, the sky brightness, there are a few clouds around it, and, and then it got brighter, that's the histogram associated with it. Um, and then I did the polarization. Um, but of course, what happens if you go back to it, it's polarized that way. So the horizon in that direction, it'll see the polarization horizontally and at the other end vertically. Um, just like polarizing sunglasses, it's all that way. Uh, so uh, anything that end would correspond to a vertical polarization. Anything across that would be horizontal. So I wasn't happy with that, but I did the measurements anyway. Um, these are just some of the measurements taken on. I've only been doing it for the last two months. The trouble is, um, because the nights are so short, I'm stuck with taking readings around midnight. And of course, the, the sun is always just below the north horizon on local midnight. So I don't know what factor the sun is compared with anything else that might be as, um, you know, artificial light. I don't think artificial light will contribute much to polarization at all, not over a distance. But the moon and the sun below the horizon does. But I can't separate them because the nights are so short. I'm always going to find the sun in the same position just below the horizon at midnight, dominating. So I need to be do it again at a, uh, when there's a longer, longer nights in the year. Uh, uh, this is just this is two hours before dawn. It really does become polarized. You can see the polarization in the sky. These are just the ISIF plots, but that's the actual pictures. Um, I've done it um, here. I'm doing it um, east, west, north, south, east, west, and north, south. So my new improved polarization filter is a great expense of taking these huge sheets and made them into cylinders. This one's horizontal and the other one's vertical. And I had to cut the ends off. And so here we go, these chimney ones. I've done the same thing, same sort of measurements. And now at least I know that the whole sky is being polarized horizontal or vertical and I can separate the two. But again, very difficult to interpret data. Yes, that's the blocked end, which causes multiple reflections internal on the plastic sheet. So it's, it's a bit bigger than you'd think it was. But that is uh, the polarization around the whole sky um, as dawn approaches. Well, it's two hours before dawn, actually. Uh, the, my final experiment is backscatter. A similar setup, but no polarization. These are my illuminating screens to calibrate the telescopes. I took them off the wall and mounted them horizontally, OK? well below the photometer. Photometer can't see them at all because um, it's way up here. And so all I do is turn the light on, turn the light off, turn the light on, turn the light off, on, off, on, off, about 200 times and allowing the sky quality meter to settle down so it's integrating in one condition or the other and not halfway in between. But the nights are very short as we know at the moment. And this is the lights off, these are the lights on, um, these off on that was a night where it was changing all the time uh, over a couple of hours, a bit of scatter. This was a good night where there was no variation in the background or not much off on, off on, off on, off on, etc. I've done a hundred, uh, I've done a total of about 10 sets over the last year in different atmospheric conditions. And what I'm measuring is the amount of light that's being scattered back locally from my lights, which can't be seen directly from the from the photometer. So I'm measuring the backscatter in the atmosphere. And of course, I can apply this. This is a function of temperature and humidity. I'll stop you know, my eyes up and I'm just about finished. 
What I've done, I've applied it to Reapham Norfolk Observatory. They had observed a school observatory. The school has sold off the field for housing development. And of course, do they move the observatory to the Norfolk coast? Do they leave it where it is? The, the lighting engineers have very carefully arranged that, that no, none of the public lighting can be seen from the observatory proper at all, none of it. However, the private lighting, of course, will do they like. However, no lighting um, planning scheme considers atmospheric scatter. None ever do. It's only direct light. But of course, I've got the backscatter ratio, so I can take the total light level from, from the planner's development and work out using my backscatter ratio how much light is coming back and will be seen from the observatory. And here's the answer. On a really clear night, it makes about 0.2 of a magnitude per square arc second. On a not so good one, a whole magnitude of loss. And I, uh, because it's skew on one side, I can use my profiles, my curve fitting profiles to predict the profile. My final topic is satellite crossings, which I'm pro you're probably aware of. Now I'm getting in any exposure with my main telescope, I'm running my piggyback telescope lens, which is 600 millimeters or so. And I'm getting a satellite crossing every, every so many exposure, two minute exposures. I can guarantee at least two or three satellites crossing my two degree field of view in any half hour, sometimes two, as you see. And of course, this is just the start with Elon Musk and, and, and Amazon's intended huge multi-constellations. Not so much at midnight when, of course, up there it's not illuminated, but within an hour or so either side of midnight, I'm getting satellite crossings all the time. I mean, this one was uh, the... Um, uh, this one is of NGC 4565, uh, four, and I've got two satellites crossing it and uh, another one in the exposure set with a, uh, another satellite crossing, and there are two in this one as well. It's just, this is a pinwheel galaxy. Um, and even in the uh, main telescope, which has, you know, three quarters of a degree field of view, I'm getting uh, um, satellite crossings as well. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christopher. Okay. Uh, right. If um, people have questions, can you wave your hand at me or uh, put a digital hand up so uh, I can s see if anybody's got anything to say? So uh, it's over to you, folks, uh, if you've got any questions. Uh, William uh, Scoopcher, can you unmute yourself? Hello, William. Yes, I'm just wondering why does the um, brightness, the sky brightness, change through the night in the way you showed it? Well, I've got various theories. It's not due to sudden switch off because it's always very gradual. Um, I don't have any local lights. My nearest the Malvern, which is five kilometres away, and uh, I'm not sure they have a dimming scheme, but s some places in Herefordshire do. But that's not the dominant thing. I think it's mostly humidity. Um, because uh, the, the, the ground is radiating to the sky during the night, the humidity content is increasing towards dew point. Up on the Malvern Hills, it will get there sooner. The Malvern Hills will, will black out the reduce of the water droplets forming up the hill. I know they do frequently, will block out the Seven Valley lighting. So it will look darker locally because a lot of the seven-bar lighting is being blocked out by the mist on the hills. On the other hand, um, it could be misty locally, in which case uh, the SQM will give wonderful readings um, as if it was in a cupboard but not seeing the stars. <laughs> Christopher, um, can you turn your uh, sharing off, please? Oh, sorry. Yes, I will. Uh, stop share. Okay. Yeah, I can see you all now. I apologise. So it's very variable, but... Um, my, my general argument is that it's cooling down during the night. Uh, you're getting local mist uh, that's affecting more distant lighting, and it generally gets darker as a result. Right. Yes, I see. I presume if you've got local lighting, the, the, the change in humidity could actually make it the sky yes. seem brighter. Uh, exactly. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And any cloud... Um, Clouds are always very scattering and reflective. If there's clouds on the horizon, it will scatter the light beyond the horizon from the cities distantly into the field of view. So it's very much dependent on the weather. 
Yeah. Not just the local weather, but distant weather as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. There's a lot to it. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, so Michael, you're waving your hand. Can yeah. you... Uh... Michael Poxon? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was really looking forward to tonight's talk because I had a sort of personal experience about this, this time last month, early early in June. Um, yeah. A couple of interesting parameters. A, I'm quite, I'm quite, actually, I'm, I'm quite near the Norfolk Broads myself. I'm in a rural area um, mm -hmm. in a very, very dry, dry part of the country. And what actually happened on, on this particular occasion was... Um, uh, basically, I'm surrounded by fields, largely arable fields. Um, so, so, so with all, all, the, all the sort of dryness, basically the fields dry out, uh, you know, basically sort of turn into a kind of dust or whatever. And the heat makes the dust rise. And, and that, sta uh, that stays uh, suspended in the atmosphere. Um, and I was actually observing... Um, and I think probably what was happening was uh, the sort of atmospheric dust was actually uh, scattering the starlight. And mm -hmm. I, was I was losing about a magnitude, which is really important for me because I observe variable stars visually. So, you know, I, you know, I need all the light I can get. Um, you know, so, I, yeah, I found that really interesting. Um, I don't know whether you'd like to add that as an example of of sort of rural light pollution. I don't have any, uh, you know, I mean, it's a very small village. Uh, there are no street lights for, you know, so, some considerable distance, a couple of miles possibly. Uh, there's no visible uh, sort of light pollution. But as I said, this, you know, the sort of uh, suspended particulates, if you like, in the atmosphere, it was, you know, they were scattering the starlight. It's horrible. It, it does. <laughs> I mean, you can see that through the thin cloud, how much scattering there is. There's a great deal. I just done my, uh, this monitor. I have a particle content meter, and um, it's always, it always gives very good, good, good quality. But the local organic content is dependent on whether I've opened a bottle of uh, cleaning fluid or someone's doing any cooking. It's dramatically changes in the house. But uh, generally, um, I didn't see any effect from lockdown uh, at all, no difference. It was just a general change in atmosphere, which changes, you know, uh, over hours anyway, nothing extraordinary. Um, but that's interesting. Um, yeah, I do occasionally get dust during the day, and that would be make a contribution because it would take a long time to settle out. So that mm. might also be an effect. You'd expect to see it more in the summer than the winter, wouldn't you, really? But of course, it never really gets dark in the summer anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, that's an interesting idea that it could be the dust that's settling out during the night, not just the water content. It's yeah. A combination. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Good. Oh, I like that. Okay. Tony, Tony M. Yes. Can you unmute yourself? I'm unmuted. Just, you. just coming in on, on the dust question. I think there was an article many years ago in Sky and Telescope about pollen. Uh, yeah. Scattering uh, uh, starlight at night. So. Or people that lived in rural communities where there was heavy farming uh, were noticing, well, the people that are observing were noticing effects of pollen. Right. Mm. Yeah, well, I have rhinitis, but it doesn't relate to pollen. I've had it all my life. It doesn't correlate to anything. I have it nearly every day and suddenly it disappears and then it comes back again. Um, but some people are very allergic to pollen and they have to be very careful about it. Which is very variable, um, but you know, um, whether that makes a contribution significantly, I don't know. Um, I mean, I do monitor. I mean, I, I have a sky. Uh, I have a, a weather station, and that logs every hour. So I've got you know, a huge. Um, and I had to replace it a few years ago, but I have pretty well continuous records over about eight years. I also have a green energy solar array and the heat pump, and I monitor those every hour. I have a huge amount of data, but that's another story. Uh, it's cost me a fortune, the heat pump, and it's failed completely twice. Uh, it's been out of action for over a year. I lost my generation tariff, but uh, it's not cost-effective, but even so. Um, so I've got, you know, 
it's not just sky glue I'm on, sir. I've got the green energy stuff in my house, so I've actually got a thermal model and know exactly how it's going to perform uh, at any outside temperature, wind, humidity, or anything else. <laughs> Crazy. Got, it just keeps me Another question then, Chris, if I may. So you were saying yeah. during lockdown, you, you didn't notice any in difference. No, but uh, certainly here in, in South Yorkshire, we're on uh, the, the flight path for, for Manchester Airport coming in. Ah, oh, the airport, yes. So the, the, the skies, I would say, were definitely bluer during the day because we didn't have yeah. the continuous contrails that we normally have. The contrails, no. Uh, we have the only Birmingham airport, but we don't get many contrails uh, over my area, which is uh, amazing. It's Snake Cradley, just west of the Mullen Hills. It's on the area on the edge of the Mullen Hills AMB, just outside. It, it, it finishes at the end of my drive. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> We, we, we get a few contrails, but not huge numbers. But I know uh, many, many parts of the country have huge numbers. That's an interesting question, whether it contributes to global warming or not, because it's a mixture. I've been doing lots of calculations and thoughts about that sort of thing. I've got the carbon footprint on my house and stuff like that. <laughs> it's never ending. I always keep me busy doing something. But yeah, that, uh, yeah I, I know Bob Myers and uh, our coordinator. Uh, has lots of um, inquiries about the effects of contrails. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Oh, yes, someone's got their hand up here. Andrew, Debbie? Andrew, Debbie? Can you unmute so? I can't hear until you unmute. Oh, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, really enjoyed okay. your talk. Oh, thank, thank you. Yeah, I'm speaking to you from uh, Almeria province, southern Spain. That's where I live. Oh, so, well. So uh -huh. I, was quite in, I was quite interested in what you said about the, the uh, Spanish Pyrenees and also Catalonia. But well, five, yes. Yeah. F five yeah. years ago, the village that I'm in, we had uh, four metre tall street lights with full aperture, 150 watt uh, high pressure sodium bulbs. So right. I, I, wrote, I wrote some technical papers to our mayor, but what I did, I, I pulled in Article 45 of the Spanish Constitution, which states okay. everybody has the right to enjoy the environment, and those that are polluting it have got a duty to fix it. Right, which, good one. Which, which went to the town hall, but I did a cost analysis as well, and we've now got full cut off 35 watt um, LEDs. The skies are uh -huh. beautiful, but that went to Dipitation to Almeria, and all the villages and all the towns have been done the same now. So it's, it's made an enormous difference in this part of southern Spain. It, what's the colour temperature? Are they blue or are they uh, turned down to uh, lower temperature? The, the lower temperature, I believe, but I've not got anything oh, that I can, uh, I, 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 like I that can physically oh. measure them with. Yeah. It's, it's made an absolutely enormous difference, and I've been, I've, I've, yeah. Yeah, I've been telling everybody that now we get a lot of light pollution from the Milky Way. <laughs> yes, well, that's why I avoid it. It's a light pollution source. That's why I tell my photographer yeah. to avoid it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, my, my superior half, who I met uh, about six years ago, uh, has a huge Mexican family. Uh, she managed to, uh, to, to leave Mexico. She loves going back to see a family, of course, and with cruises around the world, which she can't do at the moment, of course, at all. Um, but she had major heart failure, which very restricts her movement anyway. Believe it or not, last weekend she was in Madrid um, yeah. because she's actually had to do lots of elaborate tests, just done one today to submit it. And, um, you know, and we all have to isolate each other from the opposite end of the house for 10 days because it's a, uh, a yellow uh, restricted country. Um, but yeah, she was doing a virtual course, but the end of the course was actual physical in Madrid. So she felt she had to go. Um, but yeah, she, I, I still haven't managed to learn Spanish, but of course Mexican Spanish is a bit different. Uh, so I have traveled quite a lot with her, uh, but that particular trip um, I did on my own. Uh, it was to, um, um, one of these artificial light at night conferences or, or the equivalent mathematical modeling ones, I forget. I struggled to get papers published, uh, as we all do. Uh, it took me about 18 months and get through peer review for the last one on JQSRT, but I couldn't afford the page charges. So now 
everyone who wants to read it has to pay for it to be downloaded. But if anyone wants to email me and I can give you it free. <laughs> but it was a major effort. I don't think I'm going to do it again. It was so much work. But it does summarise all the work, but it's not up to date. What I've told you now is the last three months, which of course wasn't in the publication. But I have had a few publications in the lighting journal because my idea is to educate the lighting industry, but they are, they're taking things on board seriously now themselves. But they've got a lot of work to do to put things right. <laughs> I once saw a, bri a brilliant poster where, where you've got a bright sky and yeah. the individual was dim, and where you've got a yeah. dim sky, the individual's bright. <laughs> Link in the <laughs> two, which were very, 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 very clever. I like that one. I like that one. That's just very good. Very enjoyable. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm liking the feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else? Or do you want to go um, to talk to your, have a coffee break and have your normal, oh well, it's virtual, isn't it? Um, have your normal um, updates on what you're up to. <laughs> Did anybody else got and, a question? I'd, I'd got a question. Uh, okay. It's basically, uh, time limited uh, lights. Uh, you know, so, some uh, councils and some places are sort of turning lights off at midnight. I mean, yes, yes. does that have a, a good effect? Well, I know the Hampshire Astronomical Group at their observatory can see the actual turning off the lights at night. I can't because it's most of the towns are just too far away and, and you know, um, I don't know how much dimming is actually done anyway. Um, but all my measurements show it's a gradual change with no sudden switch off. But um, uh, uh, areas close to cities will certainly see some difference. So I'm pretty sure of that. And the general tendency to dimming is obviously a very good thing. A switch off after midnight if they're not needed. The highways agency doesn't have to illuminate motorways at all, except at junctions now. Okay. Okay. Uh, Andy Devi again. Okay. Yes. It's, it's just a thought. There's been a lot of concentration on the light element. Uh, yeah. But any concentration on like road surface element to get a darker road surface for uh, yes, uh, re no. reduced reflections? It does make a difference, you're right. Reflectivity scattering, it's about 4%, 5% on a new road, but then they get muddy and you know are trodden in and it starts to go up. Um, but it's always less than about 8 9% usually. But of course, sometimes they deliberately whiten roads near junctions to increase the reflectivity. But that is, a, I guess, is a small fraction compared to the total. But a lot of it isn't public lighting, it would appear, certainly in Tucson. You know, it's uh, shop frontages. But of course, in America, they tend to illuminate the car parks all night long. And there are huge car parks. I mean, I've been to Tucson and seen it uh, in other American cities. So maybe that's not typical. Um, it varies, but um, I mean, nightclubs and things like that, um, then the, a lot of lights come from shop fronts and it's going straight up in the sky, it's not controlled. Um, I think we've got a lot to learn because the effect we have in the environment is really dramatic. I mean, half the natural species are being terminated in the last 30 years, insects and so forth, and rely on them for pollination. What's more, the global warming, is, um, it's not just the CO2 emissions, uh, because the CO2 is in our atmosphere and always has been. It's a responsible 15 degrees of warming. It would be a lot colder if it weren't. But of course, it is accelerating. And the weather is coming, you know, because the temperature difference between the equator and the poles is, is, is smaller than just like a river. It's meandering more. And the result is pulling in ever-changing weather. And we're seeing it. But... Um, I think the situation is that uh, whatever we do, if we expect to have a, 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 a standard of living that's always increasing with a two and a half percent per annum um, increase, it's exponential. So that by the time we get to 2050, even if it's green energy sources, that heat, all power ends up as heat, will cause significant effect. It isn't at the moment but because it multiplies, 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 we will not have a sustainable planet. We will have to go back to living like cavemen, not that anyone's willing to do that, or go back to at least horses and cars. 
and we can't continue to eat meat like I do because of the huge amount of soil that's being imported for the cattle and they produce methane and the soil's been made from cutting back the Amazon forest mostly as I gather. I mean we can't the sustain problem. this type of lifestyle. The other problem Chris is not nobody's talking about the real cause of the problem which is exponential growth in human population that's not sustainable. That, that, yeah, that's and that the, argument that, needs to be raised. Exactly you're absolutely right. I mean it, it's it's a much broader issue than, than the G7 have been talking about. Okay. Okay. On that I rather think, uh, note. I think we've, uh, we've worked Christopher very very hard tonight uh, with this talk <laughs> and uh, uh, also the question section. So could could we uh, show our appreciation in our usual way? Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the.